Hey, I wonder I heard that. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a Monday afternoon of Chems 170, Organic Chemistry, with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, hope you all had a good weekend. I spent a lot of fun time grading tests. Yeah, what's well, important part of my job? You can, I'd rather do other things, but it's important. And by now, all of you should have seen your score in D2L. Also, you all should have gotten a email individually sent from me with your individual points or points for each answer on test number two. In a little while, I'll go through test number two. Quick side note, hope everybody's on time and forgot, remember to turn their clock forward. Last week or so, I haven't watched almost any TV or radio or anything. I've been so busy that uh, Sunday morning, I got up, turned on my computer in the morning, looked at the clock in the bottom, looked at the clock up here. How come they're an hour different? Then I said, did I just miss uh, changing my clock? And I looked online and said, yep, I did. And I have about 14 clocks I have to change. Some of them are like my microwave, my oven, my uh, tea maker, things like that. All right, let's get to work. All right, first of all, you I'm gonna be going through the answers for test two. I'll be cutting them out of the video because I don't want them floating around the internet for the rest of eternity. But some of those questions I recycle later semesters. All right, if you cannot make it to today's part where I'm gonna cut out the answers to the test number two from the video, contact me. If you can't make it to my office hour, you need to see answers, let me know and I'll make arrangements to meet you on Zoom at a special time we both can go to. All right, that's one thing. The other thing is, as I go through it, you should check and double check that I didn't make an error. No student should ever be penalized for an error I make. No, no, no. And where do I make an error? Probably on the two uh, questions that were four points. I might have only given you three. I do that once in a while. If I do, let me know and I'll correct it. And also if I make an error in grading, let me know, I'll go back and look at it. If it's an error, I'll correct it. All right, let's get to work. I think I'm allergic to students, no, I'm not. All right, at this point, if I were in your shoes, I would ask the following question. What grade am I getting in this class? Well, there are two ways of calculating that. And let me show you that. And this part, I will not cut out of the video. All right, method A, if you take the sum of your two tests divided by two, you'll get X. If X is 90 and above, you're getting an A, 80 to 89, B, 70 to 79, C, 60 to 69, D, below uh, 60, F. All right, method B, At this point, this is assuming you've handed in all your labs. And if you handle labs, you've been uh, getting good scores. And the highest of your two test scores, you pick that number, call it Y. If you're getting 90 and above, you're getting an A, 80 to 89, B, 70 to 79, C, uh, 60 to 69, D, below 60, well, that's an L. 
and that's how you do it. Now there's still plenty of time for everybody to do good in this class, except you may have, you just got to get better scores on your test. Always feel free to come to my office hour for help, or if you can't make it, contact me. I'll get set up a Zoom meeting, and that way I can help you do better. And that's just because Dr. White's very selfish, and it makes me feel good to see you do good. And that way I'm very selfish. So, uh, any questions about test two? My speaker's on, just want to check. And I should tell you, test two, I didn't do an average. A lot of number of you did real well. A few of you had problems, need help. All right, but test two is the hardest test of the semester. What do I mean by that? Historically, test number two usually has the lowest average. All right. Well, in that case, let's get back to work. And we're talking about esters. Before I do that, I have to ask, did anybody happen to pick up a bottle of vinegar and say, ooh, you don't have to do the ooh part. It has acetic acid in it, and that's a carboxylic acid. Did anybody happen to pick up a bottle of ketchup, mustard, or that glow-in-the-dark relish? I love that stuff. If you're from Chicago, and I think that's unique to this area of the country, or maybe even the world. But anyways, if you look at the label, it has vinegar, which has acetic acid in it, which is a carboxylic acid. Did you think about that? Remember, organic chemistry is all around us and it won't hurt for you to think about it outside my class. And I stole that all around us from SpongeBob. All right, let's get to work. On last Wednesday, I started talking about a derivative something made from a carboxylic acid. And this is an ester. An ester has a carbonyl with an oxygen on that oxygen has an R prime and the carbonyl has an S R group. And that's called an ester. And if you look at the screen right now, you'll see a molecule and look for what's different. What's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, should get your attention like that. And, ooh, I've got a carbonyl with an oxygen also attached to that carbon. On this oxygen, there are carbons, R prime or carbon, our example. And on the carbonyl carbon here, their carbons, and this is an ester. Now, how do you name esters? Well, turns out there are two ways of doing it. The IUPAC way, and one way, and I, I like to give credit where credit is due. A number of years ago, I had a really sharp Chem 170 student, and the student said, can't we do it this way? And for 95% of the time, you can use that student's method, which I will teach you. Now, first of all, for esters, You name the R prime, that's the group onto the oxygen of the ester as an alkyl group like methyl, ethyl, things like that. Next, and this is the IUPAC name, change the name of the carboxylic acid. Think of R prime as H, name that as the carboxylic acid, and then drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE.
So if we look at this, this is an ester. What's our prime? Methyl, that goes in front. If this were an H, this carboxylic acid, one, two, three, four, five, would be pentanoic acid. I'll drop the IC in the word acid from pentanoic and add ATE. And I now have methyl pentanoate. Now, let me talk about the student's method. This works for about 95% of the time. So you still have to learn both methods, but this you can get by when R is not a benzene ring. When it is, you have to use the IUPAC. And you still use uh, All right, so what the student came up with was just like that UPAC, name R prime in front, methyl. Name that as an alkyl group. All right, now here's what the student came up with, which works most of the time, but not always. Count the carbons, including the carbonyl group. Name it as an alkane. Pentane. And drop the E and add O, A, T, E, pentanoid. And you get the same answer, except when R is a, a benzene ring. Then you have to use the IUPAC, and I'll go through that. Now, it's time for a little gift from Dr. White. For this class, I will never put an alkyl group on R. You would name it where the carbonyl carbon is one, just like you name it. So you could have something, and here's why I'm going to do that. Then we'll do some practice. All right, this I'll never give you with an alkyl group, but I do know how to do it. I should. And this would be ethyl. Then you name the alkyl group, and this is one, two, three. Three methyl. And I have a longest chain of four. And notice how quickly it gets complicated and interesting by having to put the alkyl group on this right here, right here. I will never have an alkyl group on the R group here of an ester. That makes your life a lot easier. Well, this a little bit. Shh, don't tell anybody I'm being nice, okay? All right, let's go through and practice esters. And why don't you name that ester? Remember, name the R prime. As an alkyl group in front. And then for this one, how many carbons, including the carbonyl carbon, do you have? Name it as an alkane, and then drop the E and add O A T E.
that's not what I want. That's what I want. Oh, excuse me. My body is revolting with the clock change. All right, looks like everybody's done. What do we have? We have an ester, carbon deal, oxygen, R prime, and R group, ester. And how do we name that? The R prime is ethyl, and that goes in the front. And you could either say, the IU pack, but my students weigh one, two, three, four. So that'd be butane. Drop the E, add O A T E. And that's ethyl butanoate. Say that five times quickly. No, you don't have to. Oh, let's do another one. And there's one for you to do. Anybody been out this afternoon? I got home from the other school about 11, but I guess temperature is supposed to be really nice. All the last bit of snow around my property is melting now. Goodbye, snow. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's get to work. What's different? Ooh, oxygen here and here. I have a carbon double bond oxygen. That same carbon has an oxygen. On this oxygen, I have carbons here. I'll call that R prime. On the carbonyl carbon, I have carbons there. I'll call that R, and that's an ester. And what's the R prime? A T butyl group, or if you want, put turd, but I'm not going to. And then there's one, two, three carbons, and that would be propane. Drop the E at O A T E, and that would be T butyl propanoate. Now, when you have a benzene ring, Let's take a look at this. Here you can't use the student's method B. What, this is an ester. And what's the R prime? Methyl. Now, if this were an H, what acid is that? Benzoic acid. And you drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. And this is now called methyl benzoate. Again, for when R is a benzene ring, if R prime was H, that'd be benzoic acid. We're using the IUPAC method because you can't use the student's method. And drop the IC from the word. Remember, this is this 
carboxylic acid, drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. So that's methyl benzoate. Now I won't put anything on the benzene ring either because then that makes life a little challenging for you people, a little too challenging. And here's one more for you to try. And I think everybody's done. So let's do this. What do we see that different? Well, it's a benzene ring, but that's attached to a carbonyl. So I'm going to just call this R and oxygen. And on the oxygen, more carbons, I'll call that R prime, ester. And what's this R prime? It's N propyl. And when this is an H, We'd have benzoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. And you have N propyl benzoate. Now, I should mention, and I'll put out more detail week before the test. Test number three will be like test number two in the fact that there'll be some general knowledge and then there'll be some nomenclature, about the same number of points, give or take a few as test number two, about 35, 40, and then about 60 points or so on reactions. And when it comes to nomenclature, there are two types. One is, as we just did, give the IUPAC name for the following. And the other one is, Here's the name, draw the structure. And if I look at the clock I just did, it's almost time for a break. So instead of rushing and going over into the break time, let's take a break now. I'll give you an extra 30 seconds. Shh, don't tell them being nice. And I'll see you at 1.55. Assuming you turned your clocks to the right, come on back in five. I'm gonna get up and stretch.
Time to get going. All right, let's continue. I just gone through the IUPAC nomenclature for esters. Now, when it comes to esters, there's a common name that I'd like you to know. And it's this one ester I'm gonna ask you to learn. And let's talk about that. Let's see, do I have it? Nope, I don't have it as a slide. So it's whiteboard time. And that ester is this molecule. Now the IUPAC name that nobody ever uses is ethyl ethanoate. The common name which everybody uses and you should know given the common name, how to draw this. And that is the R prime. Remember, this is an ester. It's still ethyl. Now, where this gets the common name, use the acid. If this were an H, the common name acid, that's acetic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid add ATE, and everybody uses ethyl acetate. Now, where do you find ethyl acetate? It's one of the two molecules used as nail polish remover. And up until a couple of years ago, if you went to any big box store like that French place, as my friend says, Target, Target, or Walmart, and you went to the wall of bottles of nail polish remover, most of them, if you picked it up, would be ethyl acetate with a little dollop of, dollop, that sounds like cooking, a little small amount of perfume in there. Well, when they came out, I don't know how long ago they did, with the nail polish that you put under the lights to cure it, by the way, nail polish is very, very serious organic chemistry, high level organic chemistry. But anyways, that made a much tougher nail polish. And to remove that ethyl acetate, at least so my students told me a couple of years ago, wasn't as good as acetone. And now if you go back, next time I go to Walmart, I don't know when that is, I only go there a couple of times a year, same thing with Target. But anyways, I'll look. Last time I looked, most of the bottles were acetone because acetone does a better job of removing that real hard to remove nail polish, which is why you want it, that hard stuff. So it stays on longer, I assume. I've, you can see I polish my nails religiously, not. But anyways, you should know the common name ethyl acetate. And you should know this is the structure. All right, now there are two types of nomenclature question. The first one is, as you just saw me do, give the IUPAC name for the following. And the first one I like to talk about is methyl hexanoate. How do you decode this to know what to draw? Well, you start from the right and move left. Whenever you see OAT ending, 
It can be an ester, or I'll teach you later on, it could be something else. But if it has an alkyl group in here, it's an ester. And if this were an E, hexane, six carbons, the end carbon, I always do it on the right, you can do it on the left, as a carbonyl, oxygen. What's our prime? What's ever in front? In this case, methyl. And I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I can put in my hydrogens. And there you go. One for you. And here we go, isopropyl butanoate. Your turn. Draw the structure for that molecule, three points each. All right, looks like everybody's done. Let's do it. How do you know how to decode this? You start from the right and go this way. And OATE tells you it's a ester, or I'll show you, it could be something else, but alkyl group in the front tells you ester. And what do we do if the square E, butane, four carbons, Carbonyl carbon is at the end. I like to do it on the right. Oxygen, what's my R prime? Right here, isopropyl. Three carbons, a center carbon bonded to the oxygen of the ester. And let's do one more. And that would be n butyl uh, benzoate. Draw the structure for n butyl benzoate. And this tank with the high cost of gas. Think about all the money Dr. White's saving you from not having to drive all the way to ECC campus. I was reading this morning that some countries in Europe are cutting their um, public transportation costs in half to allow more people to take public transportation because they think that a price of gas Chicago land is high. Let's do something real quick. Well, it's not as bad, but I don't know how frequent this is. Yeah, this looks more realistic. As of March 7th, that's a week ago, 
in Europe, in Germany, a little over a liter, which is about a gallon, is about eight dollars and almost 30 cents a gallon in Europe. So we're doing a lot better, not better, but not good, but a lot better. Let's get back to work. All right, how do we do this? O-I-T-E is an ester. When you see B-E-N-Z, benz, think of benzoic acid, where our ester This part here, R, is a benzene ring. So I'm going to do that. Attached to the carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen, oxygen here. Then this group right here is my R prime and butyl for carbons. I haven't used this in a while. I tend not to because I haven't used it much in the chemical industry. Others I have. This one I haven't. And there are four bonds to carbon, and there you go. All right, now I should one day make up a slide for this, but I don't, so pay attention. And let's go through the nomenclature. For carboxylate anions. Remember, carboxylate anions have this structure. Where here we have a carbonyl with an oxygen minus an R group, and we have a cation of a metal, usually. It doesn't have to be, but usually is of a metal or we have a metal. So, how do we name this? One, and you've got to do this the old fashioned way take notes or come back and look at the video. Step one, name M plus the cation as the element it comes from and put that in the front, just like you did for R prime for the ester. And step two, Step two, use method A or B from step two of the ester nomenclature. So let's see how this works. And the first question is circle and name that functional group, two points each. We'll play that later. But what do we have that's different? Oh, I've got a carbonyl, got an oxygen, has a minus charge. And here I have a cation, M plus, and a carbonyl, I have carbons here, R. And this is a carboxylate anion. And how do you name that? What's M plus? It's a sodium cation. So what element does that come from? Sodium. 
that goes in front. Next, we can use the student's method for an ester, how many carbons, and that would be for butane. Drop the E, add O-A-T-E, and you have sodium butanoate. Again, name the cation as the element it comes from in front. And then here, name the R group, just like he did for esters. Now, let's look at another one. And here, just like you couldn't use this for esters, Here, how do you name that? Well, first of all, what is it? R group, that benzene is just an R group, carbonyl, carbon double bonds, oxygen, oxygen minus, and cation. And this is a carboxylate anion. And what is this? Oh, well, again, it's sodium. What element does NA plus come from? And here, I should mention, for this class, this is mainly going to stick to sodium, where M equals sodium, lithium, or potassium. There could be others, but for this class, I'll stick to that. And then this part, if this were an H benzoic acid, Drop the IC in the word acid, add ATE, and that's sodium benzoate. And remember I told you earlier that sodium benzoate is the molecule used mainly as preservative in pop. And remember anything that's in a can or bottle that's carbonated not alcoholic, it's pop, not soda, because we're from Chicagoland. And again, with carboxylate anions like esters, I will never put an alkyl group on the R group. That wouldn't be fun for you. <laughs> And why don't you try this one? Give the IUPAC name for the following molecule. Three points each. And while you're doing that, besides grading, I did some batch cooking which means I made a large, large quantity of different things for my large standalone freezer in my utility room. It's huge. All right, let's get to work. What do we have that's different? Ooh, two oxygens. I have R, carbonyl. Second oxygen has a negative charge and it's got a metal cation. And this is a carboxylate anion. And how do we name it? Well, the M plus, the cation you name as the element it comes from in front. And that's lithium. And then here,
the student's way, you say, oh, seven carbons, heptane. Just like an ester, drop the E and O A T E. And you have lithium heptanoate. Now, when we get into fats and oils, I'll talk about a carboxylate anion. You can go to a home improvement store like Menards or Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a an carboxylate anion that's a very good lubricant, like for your garage door rollers and other things. I buy it. And so lithium carboxylate anion. Let's do one more. And here it is. Give the IUPAC name for that compound. And while you're doing that, I'm going to look for something real quick. And I found what I was looking for. Actually, I should have looked for something else on there. And I did find it. All right, I think everybody's done. So let me get the work. What's different? Oh, benzene ring, but it's attached to a carbon to bond oxygen. And that ox carbon also has the negative oxygen, and you have a metal or a cation from a metal, alkali metal. And this is a carboxylate anion. If I can spell it. And how do you name it? Name this cation as the element it comes from. And then this, well, I can't use the student's method, but if this were an H instead of OH instead of O minus K plus, that would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC, add ATE and you have potassium benzoate. Now, an interesting story, I don't know how long ago, 10, 12, 15 years ago, medical science was really pushing hard, cut down on the salt in your diet because it gives you a high blood pressure and affects your heart badly. And so what did the pot manufacturers do? They cut out some of the sodium benzoate and put in potassium benzoate. Because what the doctors are really telling you is don't cut out on eating sodium metal. That would kill you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing not to eat it. They are wanting you to cut down on the sodium cations you consume, which comes from salt, and this sodium benzoate. So pop manufacturers started advertising, ooh, look, new low sodium pop. And they didn't cut all of it, but most a lot of it. The unfortunate thing was the potassium benzoate tasted different than the sodium benzoate and gave it a funny taste. Yuck. And if you go to the supermarket, you're not going to find it for sale because it flopped, unfortunately. All right. There are two nomenclature skills, i.e., that means that is questions. And that is draw the structure.
four. sodium octanoate. And let me do one, then I'll let you have fun doing it too. And how do you decode this to know what to draw? Well, you start from the right and move left. Now, OAT, now you have to remember, can be either an ester or a carboxylate anion. And how do you know the difference? You look in the very front. If you see the name of an alkyl group, it's an ester. If you see the name of a element, It's a carboxylate anion. Well, there's an element in front of sodium, and notice we have octanoate. If you drop the OAT ending, put in E octane, eight carbons. And then one end has the carbonyl, and then oxygen minus, because it's a carboxylate anion. Now, you don't have to show charges. I mentioned that earlier, but I always will. And what's M plus? Sodium cation. I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I'm going to get to work putting in my hydrogens. And that's how you do it. And here's one for you to do. Oh, on a personal note, I still wear my mask. And if you've been following the news in the last 24 hours, there's been a, they have a strange name for it, a hidden or dormant version of the, not dormant, just hidden version of Omicron, COVID-19, that's as fast, if not faster than the original Omicron, which is faster than the Delta variant that originally hit us. And that's starting to spread in China. So I would keep on wearing my mask if I were you, but that's your choice. I'm going to wear it. This is the school I teach at. And when I go out to anywhere, when I go into somewhere, unless I'm in my car, I'm wearing a mask. All right, let's do this. How do we decode this? You start from the right, move left. OAT ending tells you you could have either an ester. or a carboxylate anion.
And how do you know? You look in the front, you see an alk uh, element name, you know you have a carboxylate anion, see an alkyl name, you have an ester. Well, we have lithium, so we know we have a carboxylate anion. If this were an E, pentane, five carbons. And the end carbon is a carbonyl carbon, oxygen, O minus, what's my M plus? Lithium. And then there's four bonds to carbon. And let's do one more. And here's one. We've already done sodium and lithium, so I better use potassium. Draw the structure for that compound. All right, I better get the word. And how do we decode this? You look here and say, oh, OIT ending. It can be an ester or a carboxylate anion. How do you know? You look in the front, and if you see an element, it's a carboxylate anion. And therefore, oh, benzoate. If this were I see in the word acid, benzoic acid. So that's the ester or carboxylate anion when R is a benzene ring. And since this is a carboxylate anion, it has that structure. And that's how you name them. Now, I better warn you right now, I'm going to start getting some cool stuff because we're getting some cool functional groups. And remember, I'm in no way taking a moralistic view, but I'm just talking about the organic chemistry of some neat stuff. So one of the questions I, a while ago, I said, you should always be asking, why am I learning this stuff? Well, the answer, obvious one is, you want to get a good grade in my class so you can get into a program or a school. But well, why do they want you to learn about this? Let's take a look. And let's talk about esters and nature. Now, switch is going to be click off for the slide, but it's still interesting. Esters are responsible for many of the flavor and fragrances of flowers and fruits. Now, Next time you smell or taste a banana, by the way, Dr. White hates bananas, but I still like when you, knowing that when you smell or taste an ester, an ester, a banana, what you're really smelling and tasting is this ester, pentyl acetate. Now, one of my favorite things are roses. I love roses. And if you ever smell a rose, which I have, take time as you walk through life to smell the flowers, and I do, all these esters come from different roses. And when you smell a rose, what you're really smelling is an ester. 
also flowers. And hopefully in a couple of weeks from now, when spring has sprung, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it did. Uh, I'll be able to walk around my neighborhood and start smelling all the flowers. Now, if we look at esters, when we talk about that, everybody see the Wikipedia? Thumbs up, people. Esther, thank you. All right, one of the nice things about Wikipedia is they're pretty, uh, they've been, how should I say, policed a lot. All right, where'd you hide it? And if you look at the bottom, you see, let's see if I can make this a little larger. This ester, benzyl acetate, is in pears, strawberries, and jasmine. If we go down to way down here, where is it? Oh, I can't find it. Ah, here it is. Emil acetate, this ester, is in bananas. There's another one, too, for bananas. Nonol, which is nine carbons. This one, this is a common name for an ester, which I'm not teaching you. This is responsible for, guess what? The smell and taste of oranges. And even honey, what you taste is an ester and smell if you got good honey, strawberries. And you can see grapes and jasmine are esters. I don't know what, and I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, yang, yang is, but that's got a smell of an ester. So all these different things, raspberry has an ester, Pears have an ester, bananas. Here's one in apples. Here's cinnamon is an ester. Aromatic, but it's still an ester. So all these different esters are in all these different things in our daily life. Now, one of the things that I find always interesting is Mother Nature has provided animals of the animal kingdom a certain chemical called the sex pheromone. And a sex pheromone is a molecule that usually the female of a species, when is, they're in heat, uh, what would be the right term, sends off or not exhibits, uh, produces, and to attract a male of that species to have procreation, sex. And that's why it's called a sex pheromone. And if you've ever had a dog or cat, and if you had a female cat or dog, they'll attract the attention of all the opposite sex, either dog or cats in the neighborhood, because of the sex pheromones they're giving off when they're in heat. Now, one of the interesting things for many, 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 many eons, mankind has been trying to find, is there a human sex pheromone? And the answer is so far, no. But perfume is a mimic of a sex pheromone to track the opposite sex. Now, every once in a while, every five years or so, maybe longer, you hear on the radio and TV, these group of scientists have found, here's the sex pheromone for humans. And about five or six years ago, maybe longer, it was all over all the news, TV, radio, internet, everywhere. These researchers, I don't know where they were from, found out that they thought, nah, they were wrong, but they thought that male sweat, <laughs> yes, male sweat, attracted the opposite sex, women. And somehow I don't think, but then again, I'm not a woman, but those of you who are out there, let me know with a thumbs down if you don't think it would work, that before I go to a local bar to try and meet women, 
or wherever I'd go to try and meet women, I would work out real hard. So I'm nice and sweaty. No, I don't think so. But when's the last time you've gone out and bought gentlemen uh, after shave lotion has uh, owed the sweat? <laughs> Never. Now, interesting thing, marketing sales of various companies try and convince people that this is really a sex pheromone like thing. And every once in a while, number of years, you see this advertisements on TV. And actually last night I had a little free time. I was watching TV and there's a product which I don't get any money back for called Axe. And they show some nerdy looking guy uh, puts it on after shave lotion, goes out. All of a sudden, this woman or uh, the older ads were a bunch of women, if he went to the beach, would jump him because he's wearing his axe. Now, back when I was uh, in grad school or just out of grad school, there was a aftershave and a series of colognes for men called Canoe. And same storyline, you put, some guy would put some canoe product on, go to the local beach, and all the women would jump them, you know, like a sex pheromone. It didn't work, I don't think, or it'd be very, everybody be wearing them, guys would. All right, and perfumes. The next time you buy and use a perfume, Guess what? That's mainly esters. There's a number of areas in personal care, especially for women. Well, I don't know, men wear perfume too, but they call it after shave or cologne. But anyways, for perfume, they're very sophisticated chemistry. Some of the highest organic chemists getting paid are perfume chemists, like working for companies like Givadon and other perfume uh, companies. And those are mainly esters. And what happens is when you put some like right here, or right here, they're a complex mixture of esters and you're doing a fractional distillation, remember that, where your body heat is heating up the esters to make it a gas so someone else can smell it. Now, I have a story to tell you about esters and perfume. I'm not exactly proud of, but it's a true story. When I was in high school, and I don't know, I think high school guys have this habit, I could get my mother riled up and mad at me faster and I could snap my fingers. I'd say something and she was really upset with me. And when that would happen, my father would come home from work and see my mother was upset because she'd tell him and he'd come over and say, what'd you do now? And I said, I just said that. I said, you got to upset. You know what you got to do. And I do. And I did. Uh, when I got into high school, I would go over. And this is when I lived in the Skokie Lincoln area. I'd go and it was still called Marshall Field by in Skokie and Old Orchard. I'd go to the perfume counter and get my mother's per favorite perfume, which for me, unfortunately, wasn't cheap. And that's Chanel number no. five, which I do like and she loved. And the larger the bottle, the more in the doghouse I was. And it could get pretty expensive. I really pulled a bad one. And after a while, the women at the counter at that store, whenever they'd see me, they'd say, all right, what did you say to your mother now? How'd you get her upset? And how big of a bottle do you need? And I got to be a regular customer for about a year and a half until I realized, keep my mouth shut on certain things with my mother so she wouldn't get upset. I think a lot of teenage boys go through that. I know my best friend, uh, Dick Trotter did. I haven't talked to Dick in a couple, 10, 15 years. He went, he moved out of state and we lost touch. All right. Now the switch is off, but if I'm giving you a headache, here's a product that has an ester and a carboxylic acid in, aspirin. Here's the structure for aspirin. Now, how does that eliminate pain? I have no idea. 
I know how to make it, but I don't know how to eliminate pain. And right here, you have a carboxylic acid up here, and right here, you have an ester. All right, let's talk about how do you make an ester. And the best way, and the only way I can think of right now, is called Fischer esterification. There's a carbon here, bendeline carbon here. And Fischer esterification is named after the great, and I mean great, German organic chemist, Emil Fischer. Now, this alone would be a lifetime achievement to come up with this reaction, which he did. But he's more known for, and I'll talk about this later in the semester, the work he did with sugars and carbohydrates. He helped elucidate, by the way, that's a fancy word for figure out the structures of various smaller sugars. Now, back then they'd make something and then they'd taste it. And fortunately in the late 1800s, middle 1800s, they didn't realize some of those things would be poison. And he died at a much younger age than he should have. And it killed them by tasting certain chemicals, eventually killed them, sad but true. All right, let's look at Emil Fisher's Fisher esterification. If you take a carboxylic acid and react it with an alcohol in the presence of acid catalyst, H+, usually sulfuric acid is good for this, and what you get, and I think I'm going to sneeze, <coughs> excuse me, an ester. Now, the carbon in R prime attached to the hydroxyl group is the carbon in R prime attached to the oxygen and the ester. Again, the carbon in R prime in the alcohol that has the hydroxyl group on it is the carbon here in R prime attached to the oxygen. Now, if you notice, you lose H here and OH here, and you get, and you don't have to write this down, water also, but that's an organic eh. And this is Fischer esterification. So let's do one. And if we look at the, what's on the whiteboard, what's different? Well, in this first one, we have a carbonyl hydrox group and carbons. That's a carboxylic acid. In the second one, I have carbon, carbon, carbon hydrox group. Ah, that's an alcohol. And I'm reacting with acid catalyst. And what do you get? You get an ester. So what's our ethyl? What's our prime and propyl? So I have my two carbons attached to this carbonyl, which has an oxygen and has our prime. Notice I have three carbons and the end carbon of the alcohol is attached to the hydroxyl group. So the end carbon of my R prime will also be. And I've made that new ester. And this is a fun reaction. I use this A in my research to get my PhD. At one company, we actually sold esters and used it. I remember going in England. No, it was not England. Yeah, it was in England. Helping them when they had a problem with their ester formation. Uh, and I had to help solve it. That was fun. Oh, my goodness. I got carried away. I went a whole minute over. All right. Why don't we all come back at 2.51? Time to take a break.
time flies.
haven't used that in a while. And it's time to get back to work. All right, we're talking about esters, which you can find in many things. And one of those is flowers. And also remember nail polish remover, ethyl acetate, it's an ester. Can I ask you, name an ester you use in your daily life? Don't know. Why? All right, let's get back to work. We're talking about Fischer esterification. If you take a carboxylic acid reactor with an alcohol in the presence of acid catalyst H, you make an ester. And I went through one. So let me have you have some fun. And there you go. What would be the product or products of that reaction? Three points each. Don't forget to keep on handing in your labs. They're easy points. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this reaction right here and look at each molecule and say, what's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Ooh, two oxygens on the same carbon, carbonyl, hydroxyl group, carbons here, carboxylic acid, carbon, carbon. Ooh, oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon, alcohol. Acid catalyst. And what do you get? You get an ester. And what's our this? What's our prime? This. And therefore, I have my three carbons, my carbonyl, oxygen, our prime, two carbons, because you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. And you know, there are four bonds to carbon. So I will put in my hydrogens. And that's how you make an ester. Oh, let's have some fun. On test number, excuse me, test number three, on test number two, I'll have three or four synthesis problems. And why don't you try this one? What would be the two starting materials, your aqua acid to make that molecule?
all right, I think everybody's done, so I better get to work. And if we look over here, what's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Ooh, carbon double bond to oxygen. That same carbon has this oxygen. On this oxygen, I have carbons I'll call R prime. And this, the carbonyl carbon, I have carbons I'll call R. And what do we have? An ester. And how do you make esters? Fischer esterification. And what do you react? A carboxylic acid plus an alcohol. What's my R group? Methyl. So this is a carboxylic acid. What's my R prime? Ethyl. And that would be my alcohol. And if I react those two together, I would make that ester. Does anybody see the significance of that reaction? Ethanol, ethanol plus ethanol equal acid. That's right. Let's take a look at this. What is this? This is ethanol. And where do you find that? Well, in vodka and other things. And what's this? This is acetic acid. That's the common name because nobody calls that ethanoic acid. And that's found in vinegar. So if you're ever trapped on a desert island or somewhere else and you need, what is this? This is ethyl acetate which is nail polish remover. If you're at a nail polish remover on your desert island and you have vinegar, acetic acid, and vodka, and you got some acid H+, you can make your own nail polish remover. But you never thought of that. That would be a bet I'd win. Probably I'm the only one in Northern Illinois might think of that, maybe a few other people. All right, oh, let's do another one of these. Hold on, change my mind. Uh oh, it's time for me to reboot Word. Sorry about that. All right, I think we're back on track. I just got to write that last problem down again.
And there you go. What would the two things you react together with H plus ask the catalyst to make that molecule? Wow, we're getting some really nice molecules. That's pretty. Now, you know I'm an organic chemist. All right, I better get to work. And if we look at this, the question is, what's the organic product or, or what's the, <laughs> I'm gonna write, what's the starting materials? Most of my questions are, what's the organic product? And we look at this and say, what's different? What's not carbon? What's not, ooh, two oxygens. One double bond to that carbon, one single. On the single oxygen, single bonds is carbon. I have carbons. I'll call that R prime. You got a benzene ring, but I'm going to call that R just carbons, which it is. This is my R. This is my R prime. And what do we call this? An ester. And how do we make an ester? You react the carboxylic acid with an alcohol and you'll make an ester. Now, if I look here, what's our a benzene ring? And we've got benzoic acid. What's our prime? Now remember, the carbon in our prime with this oxygen is the same carbon in our prime here with the hydroxyl group, which is this carbon right there. So I have three carbons, center carbon isopropyl group has that hydroxyl group. And there you go. You react those two together, you will make that ester. Now it turns out mother nature uses this reaction obviously to make esters for flowers, the way vegetables and fruits taste. And we'll learn later, she uses this reaction to make fats and oils in our body or things we consume. So that's the important thing to know. And that is how to make an ester. Because we're going to learn later in the semester, we get into fats and oils. All fats and oils are esters. Well, now that we know how to make an ester, what can we do with it? For those who are looking at mechanisms, I don't do mechanisms in this class, even though I can do it right now, but I don't. All right, switch is totally off for the, this slide. You can have, unlike you can have cyclic carboxylic acids or carboxylate anions, you can have esters in a ring. And these have a special name. Again, click, switch is off. And these are called lactones. And lactones are cyclic esters. And you should at least be able to identify that this is really an ester. It has a common name or not really a functional group, but it's called lactone. 
And notice they have a carbonyl, oxygen, carbons here, carbons here. And this is an ester. This so happens R prime and R are connect together in the ring. Now, there's one interesting story that I need to tell you. Uh, I worked for this one company, Borden Chemical. It was located oh, about a mile away, give or take a few blocks from Harlem and the Eisenhower Expressway. It was right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. The plant was there long before the houses and somebody was selling land super cheap because it was right across the street from a chemical plant and people bought there. Uh, it's now been closed for a number of years, at least 15 years. But anyways, 10, 15 years. One of the chemicals we had on site in the plant was called uh, butyl gamma lactone. And butyl gamma lactone is also known as the date rape drug. We used it as a catalyst for a certain reaction. And for a long time, that chemical was banned in EU. And finally, while well, I was still at that company, the EPA was talking about in a couple of years, we're going to ban it. So we had to get rid of what we had because it was, well, first of all, we had it locked up so that nobody could steal it. They probably could if they really put their mind to it but we still kept it more secure than normal chemicals on that site. Interesting fact about chemicals. All right, now that you have an ester, what can you do with it? You can do ester acid hydrolysis. Here we have an ester, we're acting with water and acid. And what we get is a, the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol we would have used to make that ester. And that's acid hydrolysis of an ester. Now, this is an important reaction. Let me ask real quick. Any of you know where we're in my office or where you are right now where you can quickly find some acid water? And the answer is, your stomach or my stomach. I always think of it as a miracle. It is a miracle of life that you and I have cells in our stomach. And I think it's the small intestine or it could be large, don't uh, quote me on it, but have cells that manufacture, synthesize hydrochloric acid. And if you notice during the day today, hopefully you have been too, I've been drinking my water, so on my stomach, I have water, and I have cells that make H plus, hydrochloric acid. And that's the way mother nature has provided in our body, stomach and intestine, to break down fats and oils, so our body can use them. And that's why we're learning a lot of these reactions because they're going on in our daily life. So this is acid, ester acid hydrolysis. Let's go have some fun with it. And sometimes I'll write it like this as opposed to how I had it on the slide before. And the question is, what's the organic product or products? And on a test in this type of reaction, since there's gonna be two products, I'll put a plus sign. I usually don't, for some reason on this side, put a question mark there. Maybe to give you extra room to write it, I don't know. So how do we do this? We look at what functional group is in this molecule, what's different, ooh, 
no ink. <laughs> I got to pick a black pen. Carbonyl right here. And it's got an oxygen. It's got carbons here. I'll call R prime. And carbons here. I'll call R. R. R prime. What are we reacting with? Water and acid or acid and water. Doesn't matter what you put first. And what do you get? You get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. Now listen carefully. The carbon with the bond to oxygen here is the same carbon in our prime that the hydroxyl group is on. The carbon with the oxygen in the ester, our prime, is the same carbon in our prime with the hydroxyl group. So if we look here, what's our methyl? So I'll have acetic acid. What's our prime and propyl? And the end carbon will have the hydroxyl group. And that's how you do it. Again, ester, acid, water, you get back the carboxylic acid gas and the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. And it's your turn. What would be the product or products of the following reaction? Oops, forgot something. Remembered it. And once in a while, I'll even do that on a test. I try not to, I'll prove it. And if you think I forgot something on a test while you're taking it, you can always email me. And if it's a correction, I'll send it out to the whole class. Think about it, if you had anything for breakfast or lunch with fats or oils in it, like butter on your toast or bacon or a hot dog, this reaction, not the specific one, but ester acid hydrolysis is going on in your body. And if you finish early, please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. All right, let's do this. And if we look up at this molecule right here, what's different, what's not carbon or hydrogen? Ooh, two oxygens, and they're the same carbon. One's double bonded, one's single bonded. On the single bonded, I have these carbons, which I'll call R prime. On the carbonyl carbon, I have the same thing, but I'll call that R. And we have an ester. And we're reacting with water, H2O, and acid catalyst, H+. And what do you get back? You get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. Remember, 
the carbon in R prime with the oxygen is the carbon in R prime with the alcohol with the hydroxyl group. So my carboxylic acid, here's R prime, carbonyl, OH. My alcohol, R prime, which carbon has the oxygen bond to its center. So I'll get isopropyl alcohol here. And there you go. Oh, let's have some more fun. <laughs> Wrong thing. <laughs> Once in a while, my brain goes into a brain freeze. And before you start on this, if you look at what I just wrote, water and acid will not react with a benzene ring. Water and acid will not react with a benzene ring. With that, it's your turn to finish this. And I always forget to put the plus sign here because there are two products you get. And the votes are coming in. Speaking about that, there's election this year, isn't there, later? If you're not registered to vote, get registered. I personally, since I was able to vote, only missed one election in all my life. And that was a local uh, village election, which I was out of town. And for that, I didn't get a absentee ballot. Actually, I was out of the country. I was in Europe at the time. All right, let's do this. If we look at this, ooh, we got a benzene ring, but that's not going to react with acid and water. So that's this carbon hydrogen. So that's my R prime. I've got carbon with oxygen here and here. And let me give myself some room. And on that carbonyl carbon, we have other carbons, R. And what is this? It's an ester. I can just still see in that classroom at COD that one student years ago, as soon as I said ester, her head would swing around. Are you calling on me? That kind of look. She was glad when we were through with ester functional groups. And we're reacting with water and acid, this is acid hydrolysis of an ester. You get back the alcohol and the carboxylic acid or the carboxylic acid and alcohol you would have used to make that ester. So what's our two carbons? 
carbonyl. And here's the carboxylic acid. What's our prime, a benzene ring? How do I do that? Well, the carbon with the oxygen, this is a carbon with the hydroxyl group, which will be this one, you made phenol. Now let's have some real fun. What would you react with acid and water to make those two compounds? Enjoy. I've got another question on your screen. Give me a thumbs up if the poll is in the center of your screen or is it a pop-up? Is it a pop-up that, is it, a, is it affected when I move mine around? Is it moving around your screen now? Okay, thank you. All right, let's get to work. And the question is, what do I start with to make these two compounds? And what are those two compounds? Ooh, look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen. This one has a carbon, double bond to oxygen with a hydroxyl group and carbons, a carboxylic acid. And this one has carbon, carbon hydroxyl group and alcohol. And what do you react with acid and water, water and acid, to make a carboxylic acid and an alcohol? And the answer is an ester. And what's our methyl? What's our prime ethyl? And therefore, what ester do I start with? This one. And if you react that with acid and water, those are the two products you get. Anybody see the significance of this reaction? I'll give you a bigger hint. All right, I'll give it away. What if you were on a desert island and you wanted to have some salad dressing with an oil vinaigrette dressing, but you have no vinegar and you also wanted a good stiff drink, but you had no ethanol. But if you had plenty of nail polish remover, ethyl acetate, you could react it with acid and water and make acetic acid, which you could put in water to make vinegar, distill it out, and you could distill out the ethanol. 
so you could have your stiff drink. So that way you could have your salad and a drink with it. I like to do those type of mental exercises when I see certain things. How would I make that if I needed to on my own? It's always an interesting mental exercise. All right, let's continue on. Now, this is ester acid hydrolysis, where you take an ester, react to an acid and water, and get back the carboxylic acid and the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. Well, it turns out there's something called saponification of an ester. It's a key organic reaction. Oh, you say that about everything. And for many eons, our ancestors, and even today, use it to make soap. I bet you didn't think a bar of soap is organic chemistry. It is. We'll talk about it when we get into fats and oils. So what's the saponification of an ester? And the word saponification comes from making soap. It's the following. Remember, I'll never ask on a test or final names of reactions, but I'll use them here. And if you take now an ester and react to an acid and a base, I'm going to change this on once we get to the whiteboard. You get back not in the carboxylic acid, but the carboxylate anion. of the carboxylic acid used to make the ester plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. So let me rewrite this slightly different, making it a little more useful. And for this class, M equals sodium, lithium, or potassium. And therefore, we're talking about the base, which is this molecule, M plus OH minus, hydroxide base. There's a ionic bond between the metal and the hydroxyl group, which we normally write it like MOH. Now notice, I don't get back the carboxylic acid. Why not? Well, let's take a look at this stepwise. What I'm gonna do now will never be on a test, but it'll help you understand this reaction. I do this, what I'll get initially is the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol I would have used to make that ester. But in the presence of base, we went through this. This reacts with the carboxylic acid to give the carboxylate anion. So that's why you never get any carboxylic acid in this reaction. Because one of the fastest reactions, of the, I think this is the fastest reaction, in all chemistry is an acid-base reaction. Oh, that reminds me. Quick little thing. Actually, two quick things. First of all, commercial from Dr. White. <laughs> Don't forget, tonight I have from 5 to 6.15 my office hour. And if you need any help, and I also do it on Wednesday, come on by and say hello and ask for help. Now, if you can't make it to my office hour, let me know by email or talk to me after class, and we'll try and set up on a, not a regular basis, but if you need to talk to me, I'll set up a Zoom office hour. Because the nice thing is, we don't have to go to ECC. Now, when we taste, when I teach face-to-face, -face, 
right after class, I have my office hour and also right before, and I'm only there on Monday and Wednesdays. But with Zoom, we can expand it. All right. And let's go and look at this reaction. And if we look at the reaction I have there, we have sodium hydroxide and water reacting with this. What is this? What's different? Carbonyl, oxygen there, oxygen there, with carbons here and here. This is an ester. And I should have put a plus sign there. I always try to do that for esters. And if we react it, what's this? This is a base where M can be sodium, which it is, can be lithium, and it can be also potassium. It can be other things, but for this class, I'll stick to that. We have water. And what do you get? You get back the carboxylate anion, not the carboxylic acid. If you write a carboxylic acid there, I will mark it wrong, because you can't. Oh, I knew the other thing I was going to tell you. Hold on. And you get back, let's do this, and I'll tell you the other thing. So what's our methyl? What's our prime methyl? And we get not the carboxylic acid, but the carboxylate anion. And you don't have to show charges, but I will. What's M, sodium? What's our prime methyl? And this is what you'll get. And this is how our, not with this molecule, but this type of molecule reaction, our ancestors made bar soap. I'll talk more about that in detail when we get into fats and oils. And I just remembered the other thing. Once in a while, you have a train of thought and it goes zoop. All right. How many of you have ever seen, I haven't seen it for a while, but it used to be real popular. There's somebody's trying to sell you this cleaning product, like a laundry detergent. And they have this big glass tank on the TV screen and it's got this cloudy stuff in there. And supposedly there's clothes in there. And they take some of their product, dump it in, all of a sudden it goes clear. And they say, see how good our product is? Don't you want to buy it? Look how it made that go clear like that. And that's the typical, what we call smoke and mirrors or dog and pony show. That has nothing to do with the product cleaning your clothes. The only thing that can react that quickly to make a change going from cloudy to clear is an acid-base reaction. And acid-base reactions has nothing to do with cleaning your clothes, your hands, your dishes, because when we get into fats and oils and lipids, I'll teach you when you wash your hands, your clothes, your hair, whatever, that's organic chemistry. Yep, it is. Ooh, it's getting scary now. It's everywhere. And it is. And that's supposed to be an I. If you take that molecule reactor with lithium hydroxide and water, what would be the product or products you would get? We're doing serious organic chemistry. 
Hopefully it's not hurting you. Oh, and I forgot this. Yeah. If you finish early, please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. Finish. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. What are we dealing with? What's different? What's not carbon, hydrogen? Ooh, oxygen, double bond to this carbon with another oxygen, single bond to it. And on the single bond car oxygen, we have carbons I'll call R prime. And over here, we have carbons. I'll call that R. And what do we have? We have an ester. And what are we reacting with? Well, lithium hydroxide, MOH, which is a hydroxide base, and water. Remember, M can be sodium, lithium, or potassium. And what you get back is the carboxylic acid, no, the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester, plus the alcohol you would have used. What's our ethyl, two carbons, my carbonyl, the bond oxygen, O minus, you don't have to show charges. What's the cation, lithium plus, and then my R prime is methyl. So I get this alcohol. And there you go. And if I look at the clock, oh no, we're done. Time flies when you're having fun with esters and all sorts of stories from Dr. White. With that, I'll remind you, don't forget, I have my office hour tonight. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Make sure you keep on handy in the labs and keep up with the practice problems. When we finish this chapter, the next class after that, we'll go through esters and carboxylic acids problem set. But with that, I'll say, gang gazun, goodbye. I stole that from granny. Remember, gang gazun is Yiddish for be healthier, go in health, really. Gang gazun, bye now. I'll see you on Wednesday.